For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and their spirituality. We are standing today on the traditional lands of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Happiness is being grateful each and every day, and I am so grateful that Sydenham Heritage United Church and Fairview United Church are giving all of us the opportunity to share our t talents and our friendship in the services this summer. Thank you, Gail, and my own personal welcome to you this morning. Thank you for joining with us today for the combined worship service of Fairview United Church and Sydenham Heritage United Church, neighboring congregations in Brantford, Ontario. I just have a few brief announcements. Uh, one is that, as Sydenham Heritage people are aware, our pastoral minister, Bill McKinnon, will be leaving us at the end of August, and we will want to celebrate that relationship, of course. Uh, rest assured, later on, there will be a proper party with food and everything else once we are able to be back in the building and eat together. There will be a kind of more formal uh, acknowledgement of Bill's uh, relationship with us. But next week, August 16th, will be Bill's last official Sunday with us. So we will have a, a bit of a celebration during worship as well. And please come next week and stay for coffee time after worship on the Sydney Heritage side because we will have a chance to share stories with Bill during coffee time at least. So we we'll look forward to that next week and the real party in the future. I need to tell you I will be away on holidays from August 17th to September 6th, and Reverend Jennifer can deal with pastoral issues at that time if they arise. Namaste, the breath of God within me, recognizes the breath of God within you. Namaste, the breath of God within me, recognizes the breath of God within you. Amen. We light this candle, the Christ candle, to remind ourselves Christ is present in our midst.
let us join together in the call to worship. As the sun illuminates us and the moon glows, changing seasons speak of God's creativity. As rainbows arc through cloudy skies, the colors speak of God's imagination. As the earth provides food for all people, the harvest speaks of God's nurturing ways. As people gather to worship, we speak of our faith and God's glory. Let us join together in the prayer of approach. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with all our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend who we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And hear with gladness words of assurance. Listen. Our past is behind us. We are free to live new lives, to be new people, to try again to live to our God-given potential. Rejoice, I say, rejoice. Good morning from Fairview. We now move into a time of sharing in scripture and reflection. Any guesses what today's scripture reading might be? If you guessed the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors, you'd be correct. We move into a story now that many of us may be able to sing part of. Um, this uh, lovely stylish piece of clothing, uh, something my mom put together from I think something we found at Value Village uh, when I was in grade nine and at St. Andrews, we put on a, a production of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and I got to be Joseph and my sister took great pleasure in shoving me down the stairs that served as our pit. Um, also the, the basis of, of the stool that St. Andrews gave me when I was ordained, a stool that, um, uh, my, my stool of many colors, it also doubles well, of course, as a pride stool. And both of those um, symbols for it will, will come into play as we explore the story of Joseph in a little while. Um, we will hear in the reading today how Joseph, a uh, favored son of Jacob, one of the younger sons, and one of the sons of Rachel. Rachel, of course, being the wife that we heard Jacob be tricked out of marrying the first time last week when he um, ended up marrying Leah without realizing it and um, had to devote another seven years to working for Laban in order to win Rachel's hand as well. Um, Jacob favors Joseph and, uh, of course, presents him with uh, an article of clothing. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a while. Um, Joseph is also remembered as a dreamer. And if you, um, you um, are familiar with the story, familiar with um, the musical, I know... Um, uh, I, uh, certainly the musical helps me remember the, the dreams, the dreams of sheaves of wheat, the dreams of um, stars and moons bowing down. Um, Joseph shares these dreams with his brother, which maybe proves to have not been such a wise idea. Uh, one of younger brothers having these grandiose dreams. The, the brothers do not take kindly to this and uh, retaliate. And, and we'll hear that, uh, that reading today. We're just using the one reading today. Um, although instead of skipping over the piece of the dreams that the lectionary would have us skip, I'm, I'm using, um, the, the, I've, I've included the dreams as, as part of our reading. And uh, so I turn that over to Brian and Janet. Good morning. We're going to read from Genesis 37, verses 1 to 28. I'm going to read from verse, verses 1 to 13, and Janet is going to read verses 14 to 28. 
Jacob lived in the land where his fathers had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in an old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dotham. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother? and cover up his blood. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to what is my second last Sunday with you. And again, a special welcome to our friends at Season Spell Lane who are watching us online. Dr. Ngozi and I were very glad to be back with you this morning in person for our regular service for the first time since February, and we're looking forward to seeing you again next week. On a pastoral note, we extend our sympathy to Betty Cartwright, on the death of her husband of 66 years, Harold Cartwright. Harold's funeral was held yesterday. 
Gail Merritt sent an email this week telling a story. Not one of the many kinds of emails we receive and which I usually delete that are intended to have us in tears by the end of the story. If Gail sends something, you know it is probably worth reading. The new minister, let's call him Paul, was invited to attend the men's Saturday breakfast at Sydenham Heritage United. As they all sat down, the host for the day, let's call him Larry, asked one of the older farmers if he would say grace for the meal. The old farmer stood, everyone bowed their heads, and the old farmer began, and he said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. Well, the minister opened one eye and wondered where he was going with this. And then the farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the minister was overly worried and wondered what he had got himself into. However, without missing a beat, the farmer prayed on, and Lord, you know I don't care much for raw white flour. Just as Paul was ready to stand and stop everything, the farmer continued, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them up, I sure do love Shelley's fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up we don't like, when life gets hard, when we just don't understand what you're saying to us, we just need to relax and wait till you're done mixing. And probably it will be something even better than biscuits. Amen. Within that prayer, there is wisdom for all when it comes to complicated times like we are experiencing in the world today. Stay strong, my friends, because our lives are being mixed with lots of things we don't care for. Just relax and wait until the mixing is done. As I indicated at the beginning, this is my second last Sunday with you. That is hard for me to say, but nonetheless, it's our reality. This means that after next Sunday, any calls about pastoral matters or anything else about which you might normally call me will need to be directed to Paul. And Paul will need your support as well as you carry on in these uncertain yet interesting times. He will need time and opportunities to get to know you and for you to get to know him. We also have a dedicated pastoral care team who will do their best to assist in any way that they can. Until next week, be well. Near my God to Thee, near to Thee, in no it be that had erased me Still all my song would be Nearer my God to Thee Nearer my God to Thee Nearer to Thee Though like the wanderer, the sun gone down, darkness be over me, my high rest a stone. Yet in my dreams I be nearer my God to thee, nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. There let the way appear, steps up to hell, all that thou sendest. In mercy again 
Jesse back in me Nearer my God to thee Nearer my God to thee Nearer to thee And so let us pray. May our thoughts, our words, our deeds always be rooted in your love, gracious God. Amen. I think I may have been in early high school at the time. Um, a second cousin of mine who was, well, it seemed at the time, not so much now, but at the time, was, was an, a fair bit younger than I was. I'm just going to call him Cuz for the sake of this story. He, um, he was a carefree, outgoing, rather precocious child. He was used to being around adults and his older cousins, um, both his immediate first cousins and um, me and my sister, the second cousins. Um, he, as I say, was very comfortable uh, hanging around. He would wander around the point on adventures and um, <laughs> he was the kind of kid who uh, he came over one day and he really liked our dog, Heidi. And, um, and she really liked him, super friendly, but, um, he, he came over one day and he opened the door and said hi, and she came running out and she, uh, knocked him right over. And, uh, he was a little upset and, and went home. He came back a few hours later so that he could apologize to Heidi because he knew that he had surprised her and he, she was just so excited and, um, he wanted to, to apologize to her and make sure that they were still friends. Um, it was quite sweet. He also loved um, to wear dresses and um, he didn't have, uh, at least not at the cottage, he didn't have any um, sort of dresses his size, but his dad would take um, his own shirts. Um, I, maybe they're called muscle shirts or they used to be called, I don't really know what to call them, but sort of the man version of a, of a wide strapped tank top. And um, he would tie the, the arms around um around cuz's waist so that the body of the shirt would would form about a knee length skirt for him and uh cuz would would go around in his his skirts all the time and uh and we had we had a lot of fun together um nice summers happy happy summer memories that i've been thinking about and um the i remember i remember um he got a little bit of ribbing from some of his cousins, most of it in, in, in good natured ribbing from, from some of his older first cousins. Um, and I remember my dad reflecting on, on how, um, how wonderful it was that, um, not only that cuz was comfortable in his own skin and comfortable being who he was, but that, um, but that his father who, um, that his father um, lifted up who his son was and made it possible for his son to express himself in the way that his son wanted to express himself at the time. And, uh, and we all had, as I say, it was a lot of happy memories. I was reminded of those happy summer memories of the past as I was thinking of what to delve into in terms of um, where to go with the, the Joseph story and this reflection. As I said before, it's a story I know really well. It's a story I can sing most of the way through. Um, it's a story I've seen in movie form. Um, and it's um, a story that I've seen explored more recently by some contemporary biblical scholars, um, theologians, and, um, and some of the folks who sort of bridge the gap between theological study and um, either performance art or um, storytelling, biblical storytelling. Um, some of you may have come across uh, Peterson Toscano before. Um, he's not someone I've ever seen live, although I have drawn on one of his presentations when I did the opening worship service for the Brantford Pride Parade a couple of years ago. He... Um, 
he was at the Skylight Festival um, either last year or the year before. So if any of you checked out the Skylight Festival, you might have had a chance to see him in person. Um, and that was one of the the um, whichever year it was that he was he was going to be there. I couldn't be there, and I was I was disappointed because I, I had really wanted to see him live. Um, but to draw on some of his work, Toscano has studied the stories both of Jacob and then of Joseph and lifts up a couple of elements in the text that um, once, once you hear them and see them, it's hard to forget them. Of course, we have um, talked a little bit about Esau and Jacob, especially in, in the introduction to scripture over the past few weeks. They're compared very differently. They're presented very differently in the text. Esau is described as big and hairy and outdoorsy. He hunts and spends his days out and about. He's an expert swordsman and his father Isaac's favorite. Jacob, on the other hand, is described as smooth and content to spend his days amongst the tents, which is where the women spent their days. He cooks. Toscano points out that there are very few examples of men cooking in the biblical text. And he is the favorite of his mother. It doesn't take a biblical scholar to see that while Esau is described in what we might think of as traditionally male terms, Jacob is described in what we might think of as more traditionally feminine terms. In some ways, Toscano says, Jacob is presents as gender non-conforming. This isn't a reflection of his sexuality. Um, Jacob had four wives and a whole boatload of children. The story talks of his great love for Rachel and then Rachel's sons after her death as what he has left of her. It's just to say that he is an example of gender non-conforming character in the Bible, of, of one such character. It can be seen as that. And Jacob favors Joseph, the first of Rachel's two sons. Rachel, of course, dies giving birth to her second and the youngest son of Jacob's in the story, Benjamin. But we hear how Jacob favors Joseph. And in recognition of that love, he gives Joseph a special garment. The NIV translation of the Bible uses the term ornate robe or richly ornamented robe. The NRSV translation says a long robe with sleeves. Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice say a cloak, a multicolored coat to wear. What's interesting is there's a little note beside the description of the garment, one of those little italics letters or numbers. And if you drop down to the bottom of your page and check out what that note is, it says the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. In biblical scholarship, and when studying an ancient language, if you're not sure from the context or from what's the, the language, like how the language has progressed, if you're not sure what a word or a term means in one context, you usually go and you look for other occurrences of that word or phrase to see if that can help shed light on, um, on what, what the phrase means which is what scholars have done for ages and rabbinical writers and theologians have explored for generations and have done so in regards to what exactly this garment might be. And one of the things that probably has had them continue to write that little note at the bottom that the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain is has to do with the other usage of this phrase for this garment. The garment is called a katonit pasim, is the, is 
is the phrase of, of what this garment is that, that Jacob gives to him. It appears in one other place in the, in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible. It appears in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 18. It's in a story about Tamar, Tamar, the, the daughter of King David. And where it appears in the text, it's describing Tamar. And it says, She was wearing a ketonet pasim, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. The kind of garment that a princess would wear, the daughter of a king would wear. Toscano and the spoken word artist J. Mays III, two that I know of, and I'm sure others that I don't know of, have offered the possibility that is found directly via standard biblical scholarship practices that there is a chance that the garment that Jacob gave Joseph was the equivalent of a princess dress. And Joseph wore it proudly, and it upset his brothers so much, it made them so angry, that they were willing to be violent against him, beat him, throw him into a pit, and then sell him as a slave to be rid of it. And then do violence to the garment I know Toscano asked if the garment were so they were so very envious of, why wouldn't one of them keep it? Why wouldn't they have drawn lots so one of them might have kept it? Wouldn't have taken much tweaking of the story for, for Joseph to, to be gone and, and the coat remain. If it was so valuable, they could have sold it when they sold Joseph. And gotten a little bit more money and split that money amongst them. But instead they defiled it and made it so that there was no chance their father would ever come looking for him and defiled the coat or the cloak, the robe as well. It's an intriguing possibility not necessarily the only interpretation, of course, but it is an interesting interpretation. As Toscano points out, you have to admit that it's at least a possibility, not the only possibility, of course, but you have to admit that it's a possibility it's right there in the text. And what a po powerful possibility to have on the table that here in our text, this ancient story passed down through the ages, passed down across traditions, that here in this story, there is an example of a person who expressed himself in his own way, in a way that his father allowed um, enabled because he loved him so much. And while he then suffered for that expression of himself, in the end, he found his place in the world where his gifts and skills were recognized and he was lifted up to a position second only to Pharaoh. In a society where he could just be himself and fine robes and jewels and Makeup were part of society. Of course, I'm assuming you know the end of the story and I haven't just spoiled the Joseph story for you. It's possible. A powerful possibility to have as an interpretation of the story one that is part of a growing amount of queer theology that is re-examining our biblical narratives and finding that our rigid categories of man and woman and sexuality may not be quite as universally traditional as we might have thought. 
that gender and sexuality have been seen, understood, and even as accepted as fluid in the past, even as we are relearning to embrace that spectrum now. How might hearing our biblical stories through such a lens, with such an interpretation, speak to those who may not have seen themselves reflected in traditional interpretations of our biblical characters and stories? And how does it challenge us to reopen our eyes to our own assumptions and the way we read our texts and how we engage them and the world around us. Because of course, whenever we read a text, we are interpreting it. We're, we're interpreting it in our moment, through our particular lens, in time, in space, in our mindset. I imagine for some people, the idea that Joseph deep down maybe wanted to be called Joe and to play with his sister Dinah instead of wrestling with the boys and was so loved by his father that his father gave him a, a princess dress because that's what he wanted and he wore it proudly. For some people that's probably an intriguing idea and an interesting interpretation to think about and explore. But I expect for some, it might be challenging or even off-putting. The beauty and challenge of scripture is, of course, there's never one right answer. And we're always bringing a lens and we're only ever interpreting. If the, ch the thought challenges you, I invite you to explore that. Feeling. And if it intrigues you and excites you, I invite you to explore that as well. And if you're interested in hearing either of the two presentations, presenters I've mentioned, and exploring a little in further, I invite you to do that. Both are available on YouTube and you're seeing their names right now, thanks to technology. Scripture is something we hate and we love, that we wrestle with sometimes and ignore other times, that sometimes we want to lift up and sometimes we want to rip some pages out. But I give thanks for the voices of those who are continuing to find ways to connect to our stories in new and life-giving ways that speak to us now, that we might continue to find meaning in these ancient stories and that they might continue to speak to us today. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Music and laughter, hands and minds, curiosity and compassion. What an abundance of gifts we have. From our abundance, let us give back to creation. Let us now present our morning offering. Just a reminder to any of you that uh, offerings are still being collected. You can uh, drop by the church with a check or, or send a check by mail or go to our website where we have uh, two online options to contribute to the church. One is a donation through Canada Helps. The other is uh, you can send an e-transfer now. So uh, my great, my gratitude to you, you who are remembering the church at this time and thank you for your generosity, not only of your uh, money, but of your time and your talents as well. Thank you.
Let us join together in the offering prayer. Loving God, Mother of us all, may these gifts given gratefully be brought to life through the power of your creative spirit. But not all of our gifts are on these plates. We also offer our energy, our passion, and our time, and our love to this creation. Amen. Let us join our hearts together as a community in prayer. Give us, O Lord, churches that will be more courageous than cautious, that will not merely comfort the afflicted, but afflict the comfortable, that will not only love the world, but also judge the world, that will not only pursue peace, but also demand justice that will not remain silent when people are calling for a voice, that will not pass by on the other side when wounded humanity is waiting to be healed, that will both call us to worship and send us out to witness, that will follow Christ even when the way points to the cross. There is no shortage of ways that we can help to heal our world, O oh Lord. We just need the willingness to see them and the courage to act. So we pray for your inspiration and strength to use the abilities and resources we have for the sake of those who need them. We pray for those of us who have plenty of wealth that can lift some out of poverty, of power that can influence the world toward justice and equity, of relationships that can connect those who can help each other, of creativity that can inspire and challenge through new ideas and new visions, of time that can be used to feed the hungry, transport the weary, or befriend the lonely. And we pray for all who need ordinary gifted people to ease their grief, their pain, their trauma, their need, and their fear. 
Do not let us rest, Lord, until we have found a way to help as we may for the cause of Christ. And let's continue in prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are, set the world right, do what's best, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. We now extinguish this candle, the Christ candle, knowing that Christ continues to be present with us, in us, and through us. Please join with me for the commissioning. May the God who dances in creation, who embraces us with human love, who shakes our lives like thunder, bless us and drive us out with power, to fill the world with her justice. And as you leave this place to bring justice to the world, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace.